So uh, artificial intelligence for uh, many of us nowadays is mostly an issue of machine learning and uh, learning algorithms and adaptability. But actually, we can see it from three different ways. It's about autonomy, about machines who are, without direct guidance, being able to uh, take some decisions, like autonomous vehicles. You tell them, I want to go to the center of Kluge, and they will decide what's the best path to get you there. It's about interaction, which is my talk today, in which one of the main issues here and one of the main re uh, um, worries or uh, ways to, uh, things to consider is when AI uh, systems will look like humans. And uh, Sophia was already uh, discussed uh, before today. Uh, Saudi Arabia decides to give uh, uh, citizenship to a piece of uh, plastic and uh, wires, which not even moves, not even is intelligent in a way which we would call it. It's a fully script system which we're only able to be talking about very limited kind of things. But somehow, because it looks like a uh, person, we have all kinds of expectations of all kinds of ideas why Sophia is saying what she's saying. And the other one is, of course, the deep learning, the big data, and all the adaptability issue which we have discussed a lot uh, today. Uh, to go a bit quick, uh, when we talk about autonomy and uh, the definitions are those systems which proactively, so by themselves, are able to select one of their goals and make a plan for that goal, uh, they should be able, in many cases, to have some uh, communication, to be social, because they will be doing that in interaction with other systems or with people with them. But what we have to realize is that when we talk about autonomy of systems, it's quite different from when we are talking about autonomy of people. Systems are able of action or plan autonomy, so they can select a goal and autonomously, without directly our guidance, uh, create, uh, or create the best plan or the best action for that goal. But these systems are not able, not now, and possibly never, or at least not the way we are building them now, they are not able of select or creating, generating their own goals. It would be like this, uh, this guy here, the, the, the Roomba, uh, 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 what's it called? Uh, grass, uh, grass mower would decide all of a sudden, yeah, my goal is to uh, uh, mow the grass, but now I don't want to do that anymore. I want to go wash the dishes. Or it's like with the goal, the, the w independently whether it could do it or not, doesn't matter, it would change its goal. Uh, or it would be like the chess computer who uh, plays, th all those uh, uh, systems who play chess would decide, no, I don't want, I'm bored with chess. I win all the time at chess, I'm going to do something else, I'm going to play Go. Uh, this kind of systems which have autonomy of the setting and creating their own goals, we are very, very far from that. That's where all those uh, science fiction uh, points come and uh, all those films from Hollywood where systems come with those kind of things. We'll never be able to generate goal autonomy solely based in the way we are building the systems in terms of uh, action or plan autonomy. And we have a lot to gain by doing, giving the systems goal and, uh, or uh, action and plan autonomy. Uh, and we have probably very little to gain by giving systems goal autonomy. And I not even go into the motive, uh, the idea to generate your own motives and changing your goals based on your mo motives. It's even more complex. Uh, one of the, no, the adaptability, machine learning. So we have been discussing a lot about machine learning today. We have been discussing a lot about the big data and the need for machines to have more and more data and more and more computational power. Actually, just recently, I had a piece in uh, LinkedIn. And if you are interested in knowing more about the kind of things that I discuss, follow me on LinkedIn or on Twitter. I have several uh, point posts there. What I would like just to talk here, one of them is that, like children, uh, machines don't come up fully learned and fully trained and fully uh, developed. So we have to be able to understand these systems as a learning system. As we, it used to be, I'm coming from Portugal, it used to be normal that the cars of someone which had less than one year of experience driving to have one of those things in the back. So you know, yeah, that this guy is learning probably, we have to give it uh, some space to learn, we have to uh, give them some uh, opportunities to make errors. We should take this kind of approach to machine learning as well. 
the systems as we implement them, once we put them into the world, we have to make it very clear to users and other ones who interact with the system that the system is possibly never uh, finished with learning. But another issue is the issue of uh, big data. Actually, if I may share a secret with you, or an idea with you, we are becoming very, very lazy developers. We have a lot of data, we have a lot of computational power, and if it doesn't work now, we just put a bit more data and a bit more computational power, and we continue like that. It is not a sustainable way. At a certain moment, even with all the Morris laws which will uh, extend our computational power forever, is not the way to go. Because people don't learn like that. We are building machines to be intelligent, to be uh, looking like people, to be reacting like we do, integrating with us. So let's take a step back and see how can we teach these machines to learn in other ways, which is not just by correlation. No, no children that you know ever need 10 million images of a dog to identify a dog. Why does a machine need 10 million of images of a dog to identify a dog? Let's think about differently. Let's think about things like abstraction, which is a um, uh, mechanism that our brains use. Let's think about things like causality. Just correlations, it first is not sustainable, and secondly, it will just uh, be a kind of junk in, junk out. You just correlate with the data that you have there, and you never really get it to a better space. So. Uh, I maintain that let's go to a data diet and uh, we'll, I'm sure that we will get much better uh, systems and much better algorithms and much novel and important um, uh, applications out of it. The interaction, which was what I was, uh, what I'm supposed to talk about today. Uh, indeed, it's Artificial intelligence is not machines against us, it's not us against machines, it's about together. Together, AI and people will be able to do much more than what we can or what machines can. They can help us going into places where we don't want to go or where we cannot go. In the time of the nuclear uh, and the uh, earthquake in Japan, it was robots who went into the nuclear plant at Fukushima. We wouldn't go there. We wouldn't dare to send no one there, but we send our robots so they can help us there. It is robots who go and uh, dismantle mines in uh, war-ridden uh, countries. So we can do a lot of things together. Uh, and it is about this interaction, working with machines as they are our teammates. And there it comes one interesting issue. Machines are tools are whatever they are, the most intelligent, Sophia includes, and so on, they are tools, they are things that we build, they are artifacts, but because they are increasing in the interaction capabilities that they have, and because they are increasing in their intentionality or their intelligence, we are starting to see them much more as partners than what we would think about them as tools. No one would ever, in their right mind, give citizenship to a hammer or to a car even. We give citizenship to something which somehow looks like us. So this uh, fact, they are, they are tools, at all these levels they are tools, but the fact that we are more and more increasingly seeing them as partners also requires from the part of the development, which is where I, where I stand with my research and with what my group and my students do, requires to think about the development of these tools in a different way. Uh, so team players, we expect commitment, we expect that we understand each other, so we just think about the team with other people, you expect that they are committed to the team, that we all know that we are part of the team, and that we as team are going to do something, uh, carry a table around or whatever. Uh, we are muti mutu mutually predictable, so we understand the, or we expect some actions from each other. We can direct each other, please lift a bit more to the left, lift a bit more to the right, to take the table out of the door. We can direct each other, and we are able to maintain common ground. We both understand what's happening, and we expect the other one to uh, do that. What are the challenges? Are exactly to get a machine to understand all that. So we need the machine to understand the other, to be able to create a model of the other, which is interacting. There is a lot of work on theory of mind in mathematics and in computer science, which is exactly in that area. We need to be able to 
take control and give control to the machine. So if the machine is with us, if we are with a robot taking the table out of the door, we have to be able to expect the machine to tell us, move a bit more to the right, and we should trust that machine like we trust the partner, that it is giving us the best possible or, uh, order in or the direction in that case. And we should be able to negotiate, because if we are in a team, we all have different ways of uh, uh, seeing how to solve the problem or how to take the, the table out of the, the door. And we need the, to be able to negotiate and to interact with each other in a way that we get the best for all possible. So we have been doing quite a lot of work exactly on these things. And I will just show you a little bit of the principles that we uh, designed for this. Observ observability. So we have to be able to observe or understand what the other one is sensing, what the other one is seeing, what the other one is doing. I and we have to maintain that level of observability, which then enables us to uh, predict or to understand what will be the plans of the other one, what will be the intentions of the other one. And then we can direct. So if I see that the, I expect the plan of the, the robot is to move too much to the left, will not go through the door, then I should be able to direct the robot, which is taking the table with me out, uh, move a bit more to the right to get out of the door. So these are the kind of things which we do normally with each other, and we need to build it for the machines. And of course, we people are very good in a lot of things, many more things than what the machines are. And the machines are very good in uh, other things. So we have also to be able to design uh, these teams in a way that we take the best opportunity of the work of both. So we have to be able to design, and I'm not really going into details here, I'll just give an example. So if it's about finding a fire hose and pick it up to uh, uh, combat a fire, a, a fire somewhere, we can think about looking at different alternatives in which the performer is the robot and the human is supporting or the other way around. And then with this type of work, this type of tables, we can see which is the best combination depending on the capabilities of the robot, the capabilities of the person, the situation and so on. We can analyze the different situations and then we can decide what are the best ways to uh, design this interaction in a way. So we are not really designing only the robot, we are also de designing the interaction between the robot or the agent. They don't have to be physical. Uh, <coughs> the, they don't have to be physical. Uh, the interaction in a way that is the best for the situation in which we are. So that is basically in a very short nutshell how we are working on designing systems to uh, interact and to b work with us in ways that we can trust them and can use them beneficially. But the other last part, I want also to talk about the issue of responsibility, like I start with it. So if we have systems which are able of uh, being autonomous, adaptable and interactive, we also need them to be responsible, to be accountable and to be transparent. And this is what I have been working with my group and which we call the... So the responsibility has to do about taking the decisions of what is going to happen. The decisions are, at the end of the day, always decisions of people at all levels, from the one who developed, the one who built, the one who bought, the one who sold, the one who put it in the road, the one who uh, what, uh, uses it, the, the legislations around. So, and we have to make sure that these decisions are clear and are in implemented into the systems in a way that we can understand who is responsible when. So if you talk, I take again the example of the self-driving car. The car itself will never be responsible for whatever uh, people it might kill in a traffic accident. The car again, like Sophia, is a piece of plastic wires and metal. It's a tool. Somehow, and we have that already now, once there is an accident with a car or with an airplane or whatever, we are able to identify where lays the responsibility. Is the person who uses it, who uses it wrong? Is the person who willed it, who willed it wrong? Is the people in the road which took uh, not enough uh, care of where they were? So there are ways to do that. So responsibility is about understanding for each of us involved in whatever system it is, where and how 
we can understand our, our own responsibilities. For that, we need the system to be accountable. We need the system to be able to explain why it did something. This is the more important as the systems are going to adapt and to change and to learn, and they are not anymore the system that we built uh, long ago. So we want the systems to be able to explain, to describe, yeah, I went to the left because in the right there was whatever, and I didn't really notice that there in the left there was uh, some, uh, I don't know, flower pot or whatever. <coughs> so we need that expl explainability, and we also must be able to inspect how was the system built. So the system is in a state after all that learning and all those iterations, which is not anymore exactly how it was built, but we need to be able to inspect that. And most specifically, we need to understand which is, what is the data that the system is using to, to be trained, to uh, make its decisions, what kind of things is the system sensing, is the car able to sense one centimeter big things, or it is only uh, able to sense things which are 10 centimeters wide? Is the car able to sense that an obstacle is a person, or a stone, or a dog, or whatever, or is it not? So we have to have all this information about how, how is the car, or whatever other examples, uh, how is it using the data, and what uh, data did we put there for it to learn, uh, to start with? So there it is, the art principles, accountability, responsibility, and transparency. And again, if you want to see a bit more, I can share the slides with some uh, thing I just uh, wrote recently. Uh, a few more. Okay, so but we are going to build these systems to be responsible. We want to build them in a way that they are uh, integrated and understanding how we function. So we want them to follow our values, to do the things as we do, to greet us as we cross the door, because that's what we are used to. We want them to have their, our social norms and so on. So we have to be able to understand those things. If we are building systems to be behaving ethically, we have to be understanding which are the values that we have that we want the system to follow. And if we know that, how we want the system to follow those values what kind of ethical theories or ethical principles should the system be using in order to get there. And if we know that, then uh, we want to implement it in a way that we understand, again, like I say, the role of the different stakeholders. This is where things get difficult and it's where things that, for me as an engineer, are not so interesting. I want someone to give me the requirements, tell me what to do, and I will implement it. But in this case, it's actually not me, not the philosophers, not none of us have a clear-cut uh, answer. So if we talk about values, we can think, okay, we go see what are the sources for values. We have values that we learn from practice. We have l uh, values that we learn from ethical studies and philosophers and moral uh, decisions and so on, from the religion, from law, from so on. So we can go there and find which are the values that we want to put in the system. As you all can understand, firstly, these things, they might, in the most cases, go in completely different ways. You can all, if you think a little bit, think about issues which are legally acceptable, but probably more morally not the best. And the, we have at this moment in the Netherlands a huge discussion about giving tax benefits for the huge multinationals. Everybody thinks, yeah, if we are putting a lot of taxing in all the single the people working in the Netherlands and we are taking all the tax or uh, giving no taxes to the Starbucks and the Googles and whatever that are. Uh, they all, all those companies are Dutch, by the way, because the, of the tax, uh, the tax benefits of the Netherlands, they all have kind of uh, headquarters in the Netherlands. So those are kind of things which the legally and ethically are differently. So you can think about all those things. Think about smoking, which used to be acceptable at all these levels. And nowadays, even if it's still legally allowed, is something which we socially don't really accept very much anymore, at least not in the shared environments with kids and so on. So there is not here a kind of uh, give me the set of values that I can implement into the system. It gets worse when we get into the philosophy. And I'm not a philosopher, so I'm going to get out of this thing, just a list of 
usual uh, theories of uh, ethics that the philosophers use. But let's say, ex ex uh, get the example of a car. We, we, we can imagine that I want to build a car which will behave ethically. I know that I want the car to maximize the life and the well-being. If uh, the, the, I, know, I know the values, I just decide. The values would be that the car would should, uh, maximize well-being of people. If I have that, and I am going to build the car according to a utilitarian theories, then the car would be building, uh, sorry, will go for the results, would count in you know, every situation in which has to take a decision. How many people am I going to harm if I go left? How many people am I going to harm if I go, if I go right? And it counts and it will maximize the number of it is. You probably all know the uh, moral machine uh, studies done at MIT. If not, go try that. And there you will get forced yourself to decide, am I going to kill uh, old ladies or young boys or uh, chickens or cats or uh, whatever, all kinds of things. You will have all kinds of options. And it's all mostly based in this idea of maximizing life is the best that we can do. And that's what the old utili utilitarian the philosophies say. If we get to Kant, which is there already, if we would build a Kantian car, like the one there, then that car would be about don't do harmful action. So if the car has to do a decision, which is this, it knows that it will harm someone, the best option for the car is not to take the decision, which means that the car then would just roll in whatever direction it is without without all, with all the consequences of that. But that would be the Kantian thing to do. We can go into Aristotle's even further. And Aristotle would say that the motives of the car, if we can talk about motives of the car, that's what matter. We have to have pure motives. Whatever we do is not our actions, not our results. It's the mot motives which we do. And then the car would have the motive of arming the least of them. We can continue like this, there are many of them, and uh, you, uh, every philosophy uh, book will show many of them. But it shows you that even if we know which values we would like the car to have, we still have to decide how are we going to tell the car to deal with those values. And if we know that, and then we could personalize that, we can go to the shop and buy, uh, please uh, sell me an uh, Aristotelian car because I like those ones most, or a utilitarian car, or so on. But then we have to implement, and actually the point I want to make is that actually it doesn't matter which are the values, which are the norms, which are the implementations that we do. You will, every, every time you choose one, you will uh, be wrong for the ones who choose the other ones. What is important is to make it explicit, to make clear how are you interpreting the values in terms of the social norms and whether those norms are being ethical for us and for the machines that we are building. And how are we con concretizing those norms that we decide the car to take into the functionalities of the car? And then we can ask ourselves, are those actions of the car the most social according to our rules? If we make this explicit, at least we can show accountability and transparency of what we do. People might not agree with you, and probably they will not agree with you, but you can show what it was, and you can also uh, argue one way or another. If we don't know if it's all implicit in whatever code that we did, we cannot really discuss it. And it's just an example, uh, let's go on. Another last one. We have been talking a lot uh, today, and also in my talk, about the car taking the decisions. The car, we build the car, we make an algorithm in the car, which makes the car, or whatever other example we want, to take all the decisions. But actually, and that was the first part of my talk, it's best to make it in a way that it's not only the car. The car is good in a lot of things, but the user is also good uh, in a lot of things. So if we can go together and collaborate, the car and the person in the car, probably we can get things in a completely different way built. We don't really have to make it all into the car. Or we can go even further, and we can go, let society think about it. So let's build the infrastructures in a way that whatever the car does, whatever the user does, they are following whatever uh, institutional or social norms hold in that place. I just noticed that here in Kluge you have those uh, trams which follow the line, so that tram does cannot decide at, at, the, 
any moment to get out of those streets because it only has those. So the infrastructure of Kluge is determining the way the trams in Kluge can drive. We can think about the same kind of things for the infrastructures that we are building for smart cars and smart machines. Actually, in the Netherlands, we are thinking about building highways in which the highway itself takes control over all the cars that get into the highway. So the moment <coughs> the car gets into the, the freeway, the freeway takes the control over, so it would be a kind of a huge cruise control for all the cars at the same time, and the highway will regulate the distance between the cars and so on. So that's another option. And of course, we are left with another option, because I still have here a box, and that is just to leave things to random. In a sense, yeah, we all laugh, and philosophers get very nervous if we talk about random, but in a sense, that's how we do uh, decisions, how we decide. We don't know all the time how we decide to do A or B. So maybe there is something to, talk, to say about it. So I think I'm more or less done here. I just want to make the last message, and that is we are the responsible party, not the machines. Thank you. Thank, 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 thank you very much.